Kevin? No. It's Iowa. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Pot of Dreams. Ben, uh, what what are we watching next week, next episode? Whoa, 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 whoa! Settle down, champ. We haven't started the podcast yet. And now the next segment is the Five Degrees Field of Dreams. Ben, you want to start? Are you having a stroke? Ben, uh, next segment here is the rating. Would you rate this movie at? Uh, oh, I get it. You're doing this whole thing in reverse. I I can't remember. Memories are unreliable. Maybe uh, maybe I should take a picture. Hey, Eric, just remember Sammy Jenkins and shut the hell up. Up next on the Pot of Dreams, it's Memento. I have this condition. A condition? It's my memory. Amnesia. No, 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 no. It's different from that. What? Since my injury, I can't make new memories. Everything fades. If we talk for too long, I'll forget how we started. Next time I see you, I'm not going to remember this conversation. What's the last thing that you do remember? My wife. That's sweet. Dying. Lenny! I guess I've already told you about my condition. Oh, well, only every time I see you. You don't remember where you've been or what you've just done. No, I can't make new memories. It's like waking. It's like you just woke up. Maybe I can help you find him. Are you sure you want this? My wife deserves vengeance. Do not trust her. She's going to use you to protect herself. I think someone's been trying to get me to kill the wrong guy. You can question everything. You can never know anything for sure. Teddy, don't believe his lies. You wander around playing detective. Well, maybe you should start investigating yourself. Who did this to you? You did. I want my life back! Why are you asking me? I can't remember what I've done. All right. uh, Thank you, everyone, for joining the Pot of Dreams. Um, This week's episode was such a treat for me. Memento. Love this movie. Uh, Wanted to just rewatch it, so that's why I picked it. Loved it. Loved it on rewatch. Ben, what would you think of Memento? Oh, I, I loved it as well. There's a lot of things to talk about, uh, for sure, about this. This is a movie, if you are into like film theory and discussion of narrative and meaning, there's a bazillion things going on in this movie to, to digest and break down. And this is a film snob, film snobs movie. This, this is great. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, like, uh, uh, you know this, but people listening to this might not. Like, Christopher Nolan's probably my favorite maybe my second favorite director and his movies are like my favorite movies. I just, I love all, of, all the films he makes. And, um, this is one I just hadn't seen for a long time. I, I don't think I saw it in the theater. Did you see it in the theater? Oh no, not at all. I mean, I was 16 okay. when this came out and it's a movie that I, I would not have appealed to me as a 16 year old. And I frankly wouldn't have probably understood well, 90% of it. Other interesting is rated R. So sure. Makes sense. Um, so I, yeah, I would have been what 17 or maybe I just turned 18 when it came out, but you know, I don't think I saw it in the theater either, but it's it's his only rated R movie, I think. Um, Inception's not rated R, Interstellar's not rated R, not even Tenant's rated R. So uh, I thought that was kind of interesting, too, because, I mean, this is pretty violent. There's a lot of violence in this movie. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I probably saw it, uh, it was like a dorm room movie for me, I'm sure. Somebody had it in a dorm room and watched it, and I've probably seen it one other time since then. Um, and then rewatching it now, it's just, just never, never, it's one of those movies I just never rewatched and saw it on HBO max and thought, thought it deserved a rewatch and it did not disappoint. No, you're, um, you're right. It deserved a rewatch. My experience was similar. I mean, I probably saw it later than you. I saw it sometime in college. It might've been like 2006, 2007, several years after the fact in a house I was living at in college, probably when I watched it and I haven't seen it since. So it, it was pretty excellent. The interesting thing for me is this is the first time I've watched it since Tenet. And for those who don't know Tenet, is a very, very similar sort of idea as this movie. Um, whereas I think this movie was so revolutionary, the idea of sort of the starting at the end of the movie and playing one part of it in sort of reverse chronology, another part going forward in time, 
the movie ending at the middle and then kind of coming all the way back. Just so brilliant how that was set up. But Tenet does a very similar thing where there's like a technology that makes them go back in time. And halfway through the movie, they actually go back through the full movie again. So it's it, it was it, the thing for me rewatching this is like I kind of like Tenet more. Um, and I wouldn't have guessed that just, you know, because Tenet was kind of a movie that sort of came and went. And I mean, it was in the middle of the pandemic, but I think, if, you know, most people didn't wouldn't consider if you're ranking his movies, it wouldn't consider Tenet higher than Memento. But I might. Um, OK, th- I'm going to stop you. We're going to take a we're going to digest that. Memento definitely made me appreciate Memento more. It did not make me appreciate Tenet more. It made me appreciate Tenet less. Yes, he did okay. The, he, did the, he did the backwards chronology thing better, more coherently, more interestingly. Now, maybe on a rewatch, I would start to understand Tenet more and cooler themes would, would prevail. I don't know. But Tenet was one of those movies that just looks cool, but it was genuinely super confusing. I was never confused For me, by Inception, but I was very confused by Tenet and what was going on and who was doing what and where and why it was happening. And it oh, didn't make sense. Oh, you were confused. That was your, your criticism of it. So rewatch it. You have, to, you have to watch it a second time. Have you, you only saw it the one time? Yeah, I only saw it the one time. Yeah. You got to rewatch it the second time through. It's just it's all unlocked, and you're just like, "Holy shit, this is brilliant!" Like this is literally the, I mean, but watching Memento was like kind of the same idea that the sort of, you. But the pr- problem I had with Memento, there's no reason that it's like that. That's all just sort of like movie making magic that it, that it's not in chronological order. Like it doesn't have anything to do with the story. There's no reason it that it has it's to do with narrative do and meaning and context. So I think there's all sorts of really compelling artistic. It's just reasons an editing technique. But, but it doesn't. You're fixated on plot mechanics. But I, I think this movie would not work as well. You could do it straightforward. You could make sense if you just watched it straightforward. Well, and it's still enough, interesting. There, but I, there's yeah, a YouTube. Did that. Yeah. I, I watched. I watched the whole thing, and it actually changed kind of one thing that I thought about the movie. Whereas this this guy, if you haven't seen it, go to this YouTube video. I, I don't remember the just YouTube, like, memento in chronological order. And this guy, he, like, recut the movie. And it's only, like, 20 minutes. He only shows, like, the really important scenes. So you don't have to, like, rewatch the whole movie. But um, the interesting thing, and maybe I'm jumping ahead of myself, but um, one of the reasons I didn't like a memento as much as in, or as, as a tenant is the dead wife stuff. Like, Christopher Nolan's always got to have a dead wife in his movie. And Inception's got a dead wife. Batman kind of has a d- sort of dead girlfriend. But Tenet doesn't have any of that. It's just like a straight-up action movie with the time stuff. But in, in this guy's breakdown where he shows in chronological order, he kind of presumes that the wife wasn't murdered, that that, that Sammy Jenkins, the, the guy he sort of keeps talking about, remember Sammy Jenkins, is actually him. And, and he's the one with the condition. And his wife was a diabetic and did the, so, so that he's just making up this whole idea of trying to kill somebody and get revenge because he didn't want to basically admit that. Well, he that's what Joey killed his wife. suggests at the end of the film. Right. Yeah. And so you don't, and you don't know, you can't really definitively say that everything Guy Pierce, who, you know what Guy Pierce is not forgetting. He is not forgetting to work out. I'll tell you that he's getting his workouts in somehow. Somebody's remembering to, to do all this. Maybe he's forgetting to eat. He's forgetting to eat. Well, he's, he's got a lot of muscle tone for a guy that's not eating. Uh, well, part, this part, the part of the problem I had with this movie, too, is the tattoos of it all. It's like, who's giving this guy these fucking tattoos? Scotty like, tattoo people. You pay somebody money. Yeah, but he's tattoo. got, like, shading on the font, and it's fact, and then it's a little thing, and then fact, too. No, why, why would you write these giant tattoos that just say fact on it? I mean, because it looks really cool on him. That's why it's like that. But it, it has it, to do it, – he's grafting facts. His, his identity, his core identity is literally manifested on his skin who he is, what his motives are. But you can't trust anything he says. You don't know anything. He's confused and wrong at about every turn in the movie. And so you hear, so it's trust that he knows exactly what happened to Sammy Jenkins and, and he's totally correct and he disagrees with the cops because he's, he's correct and he knows exactly what happened. I mean, he even says himself, memory's not reliable. So how can you trust at all what he says in his version of events? I mean, I just don't think he can. So it's very possible that he killed his wife or his wife left him because she couldn't stand being around. I mean, you, you can't even know. That's the whole point of the movie, I think, Eric. I mean, do you disagree? Do you think it's definitive? But how did he have the head injury then? If if he if his wife wasn't attacked, 
in, in the way he remembers it. Well, we don't know. And how would he know? How would he his know memory how loss? he got the memory loss? How well, he, he remembers really... everything up until the incident. There's there's at some point in time where he can't remember. He can't make new memories. But how would he remember if he has that. memory loss? How would he even retain that thought in his head? Well, what was his last memory? They keep asking him that as when his wife was killed. That's the last thing he remembers. Okay. Fair enough. Now, is that is that true? I mean, that's the other interesting thing, I think, sort of supporting your point. The interesting thing about how it's laid out is you start to kind of misremember things. It's like, wait, is that what happened? Because once you get towards the end of the movie, which is really the middle of the movie, you start thinking back on the things you already saw. And you're like, wait, how did that window break? Or wait, you know, who is that guy chasing him? And you're kind of it kind of things get a little fuzzy, at least for me, get a little fuzzy and you're. Because it's it, it's one of those reasons why you want to rewatch it again is like to track it, but um, it I think it plays into the idea of how it's laid out with the two, sort of two timelines converging in different directions that your memory starts to get a little distorted on what happened in the movie, which I think is part of the puzzle too. But um, yeah, so you don't have, form an opinion on what actually happened. You don't really care. It doesn't well, matter. Well, I don't to you. think that's the point. I mean, he can say what he remembers, the last thing he remembers, but you don't know that that memory is reliable. You can't know. It's quite possibly. I mean, he says the details change, the scenario changes, how things look change. I mean, he says all this. Uh, yeah, the, the eyewitness is the most uh, unreliable form of testimony or whatever. Right. Yeah. So you can't say that his version of defense for sure, like this is the last thing he remembers. So he says it's entirely possible that he created a bizarre version of events to help him cope with the trauma or to give him a sense of identity and purpose and routine and ritual so that he has purpose, right? So that he has meaning in his life. So he's, he's going to get John G because John G is the man that, but that raped and murdered Teddy his wife. Teddy was for sure using that, right? Like oh, we absolutely. know that for sure. Yeah. He, he, he was, he's, he confesses to that. He says it uh, and you can see it. I mean, and so Carrie Ann Moss uses him. Uh, for sort of, uh, sort of, but see, that was the other thing about the video is like, if you focus on her perspective, she did kind of use him to get what she wanted, but she was also really trying to help him in the end. She thought that this, te- the Teddy guy was the guy that he was after. So she did try, you know, got the license plate number. She actually helped him find him or, you know, tr- track it in his mind that Teddy was the guy that he was really after, even though Teddy wasn't the guy that killed his wife. So he was the guy using him. But well, that, well, that's basically Joey Pants's argument. Hey, you, you feel this need to kill somebody to feel like you're vindicated and you avenged your wife. So she gives him this false target that he says, "Hey, that's what I've been, I've been doing you a favor, finding somebody to kill. That's what you want. That's who you are." But he did burn the pictures though once he realized that. So in in a sense, he did want to forget, right? Like he did want to like not remember that he did that, not want to have any evidence that he killed the guy. So, um, yeah, I don't super, super interesting idea. Um, you mentioned Carrie Ann Moss. Why wasn't she a bigger star? What, what was the shoes in the, this and the matrix, like back to back and then like nothing else. What happened there? I, you're asking the wrong guy. I don't know. I'd have to you, you figure know, out what movie well, executives are doing. I, was, I think she's out. great. I think she's great in this movie. She's amazing. I, I thought. The scene where she like dresses him down <laughs> is incredible. And okay, so it's incredible when he hits her. Is that incredible? No, that, that was not a good, not a good look. Not, a, but I mean, no, obviously, you know, hitting a woman is is never the right thing to do. Um, but she was, you know, she was getting after. Are you playing? She had it coming. Oh, oh. No, I'm Uh-oh. not saying that. She ran her mouth off a bit too much. Certainly not saying that. You're saying Certainly somebody trash talked your wife that ridiculously. A woman did. You'd start pummeling her. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely not. No. No. Okay. No. All right. Certainly not We've saying that. We've got a fair amount of domestic saying... abuse in these last three movies. This. I mean, yeah. What's going on with that? That's what, a bizarre why are we picking... side pattern. As like protagonist. So you talked about yeah, we're three for three. Not <laughs> you talk about sometimes not being able to relate to the characters of the story. What about this story do you relate with, Eric? I was wondering that. Um, nothing, and that that's kind of the I guess the takeaway. Like I, I didn't. It, I, I think he was too like sort of overly the overly dramatic monologues kind of distanced me from like what the plot of the movie was and like who who he is. It just it, it seemed like overly dramatic. I mean, it, obviously, Nolan wanted to hear himself talk through um, uh, Guy Pierce or whatever. That's his name, right? Guy Pierce. Guy Pierce is the actor. Yes, he plays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, 
and so you know he gave him these sort of the the phone call where he's just talking to the cop and just sort of explaining everything. I, I, I don't know. And again, the, the dead wife thing, like why does he always have to have a dead wife in his movies? I, I, I get, I get why there's criticism of that. Cause you know, inception is kind of the same way as like his wife died. He didn't want to remember that. And this, you know, basically the whole plot of the movie centers around. It's his about grief trauma with his dead and wife. repression, right? I mean, doesn't, yeah. I mean, isn't that a theme in inception where absolutely it's Leo's yeah. fault that his wife dies. And so he's repressing that. And okay. hundred percent. So that, yeah, that, I mean, that implies that, that he's responsible for his wife's death in some ways. That would be, if you're looking at Christopher Nolan's oeuvre, that's kind of a, a recurring theme. Does he have a dead wife? Is that what is that? Because like, like I said, even in The Dark Knight, like Rachel dies, and then he spends the rest of that movie and the whole you know last movie sort of about the trauma of his dead lover. Like, what's the deal with that? Why does Nolan always have a, a dead I don't know. I, that, he's just not very great with emotion. I mean, if you're going to criticize Nolan as a filmmaker, like if you think Interstellar, I I, I don't know if the wife died in Interstellar. There was yes, a, yes, yes. He, the the um, McConaughey's wife is dead. That's, that how, he just that's how he's got to do emotion is grief. That's the only one he can kind of relate to and get a little bit. I don't really know because that's a, it's weird, right? Yeah, that's a, that's definitely a thing. I, I haven't seen. Insomnia in a long time. I don't remember. I know he didn't write that, so maybe you don't count it. But uh, I don't know if yeah. there was a, a dead wife in that one either. I don't know if Al Pacino had a dead wife. It would would not be a surprising if he was just lonely and sad because some woman he loved was dead. Uh, but you know, I don't think you can understate how unbelievably original this movie is. Like, oh yeah, it, there's not anything I mean, like the it. The plot, it's it's a sort of a noirish. You well, know, well, what is the plot? Trying, can you articulate in a succinct way what the plot it, is? Guys, the guy uh, he's trying to figure out who killed his wife. But it turns out the cop is basically using his condition to get him to kill people he wants killed. And Carrie Ann Moss does the same thing, and he slowly kind of figures that out and then kills the guy. And then I mean, that's basically what happens in the movie. And then forgets. And then what's he going to do? Uh, well, I, I don't know if he – we don't know what happens after he kills Teddy. That's that's the beginning of the movie. The amazing scene. Like, dude, the, the, the way this movie starts where he takes the picture and he's shaking the Polaroid and it's disappearing – like oh, yeah. that that the opening that is credits or whatever were incredible. Yeah. How well, it's it starts with the image and then goes backwards and you see the picture right. slowly. And then, and then the gun goes in the bullet and, you know, and it's telling you what's going away. on. It's something I probably right. wouldn't have figured out a, a long time ago, but like, Oh, he's telling us this is all happening backwards. I mean, this is, this is a tell right. on the front end here. But the first time you're seeing it, you're just like, what the, what the hell no, is Your brain's this? waiting for the picture yeah. to get clear and then it gets less clear and it's really confusing and disoriented in a good way for sure. Uh, but I mean, I t- but that's the last thing that happens. We don't know what happens after that. We don't know what happens after he kills Teddy. He gets to do whatever. I mean, it's this bizarre reset. He's got this episodic memory where he only has meaning for, I don't know, half hour. I don't know if it's even that long. I don't know how long his memory lasts. Five minutes. Yeah, the YouTube video is like 20 minutes of all the important scenes. So it's basically, yeah, like 20 minutes of actual time. Yeah. Cool. So he gets to just have a reset. Oh, oh you mean how long does – before his memory resets? Yeah, that was a little fuzzy in the movie. It, it kind of came and went how long it was because there's a scene where – remember where she Carrie Ann Moss has him in her place and then she comes in and that's when he hits her. And well, then she just goes back. back. It's it's brilliant because you like – in chronological order, she comes in and is like, hey, here's this house. Make yourself at home. If this is helpful, please stay. It's all good. And then that's sweet. And then, and then she starts like – she leaves and then comes back and berates him. And gets him to commit, you know, abuse. And then she leaves again. And it's like, this guy hit me. And then each scene, it's, and it's interesting. How he reacts to women when he first sees them versus how he reacts to men when he first sees them is there's this very gendered way. He's very suspicious of any dude that he talks well, to. Yeah, and that, as a that, woman, he's a lot more paternalistic and protective. Well, the, what, the one part that was kind of crazy, and maybe the, I'm going on a tangent here, is the scene where he sort of wakes up in the hotel room. On the toilet, and he's all, he's like, I'm not drunk. I, he's holding this bottle of booze. And then he just decides to take a shower, which is kind of a weird choice. Well, he's, but then all of a sudden, he, then he then he forgets, like, why am I in here? What's going on? And he sees a guy come in, and his instinct is just fight to fight the guy. Yeah. Which is like, if, if you're in a hotel room taking a shower and some dude walks into the bathroom, like, would your instinct be just immediately start fighting the guy? I don't know. I thought that was an interesting, like, okay, is that just like a, a dude thing? Like, if a woman walked in, he obviously wouldn't just start fighting her. No, he I would be very different. He'd be like, oh, what's going on? Every time he's doing it, it's very different. Um, 
the con but he's using context clues always he's always relying on context clues and he's always relying on his instincts and his instincts are very wrong often I mean, this is why he's super unreliable he tries yeah, to glean I, who's oh, doing chasing what. that guy wait no he's chasing me right i mean he's I like, like oh, why am i in the bathroom i don't feel drunk and he's like oh i guess uh, it, i'm at a hotel i need to take a shower i'm kind of gross i don't know when the last time i showered kind of i smell funky and i'm in the bathroom i must have been coming here to take a shower i mean it's a, a reasonable conclusion and most of the time i couldn't figure out why that guy didn't know he was taking a shower yeah that's weird but like I, someone's got to be in here i right? kept thinking yeah. like he's like what and he pees and he's like there's somebody in my hotel room and i don't care this is the guy i've been trying to stop that that was baffling yeah. to me i didn't understand that because the guy takes the time to well, because he has right he's looking for yeah yeah right right uh leonard he's looking for leonard yeah dodd's looking for leonard because he has the money because he took it from the car right um yeah so that that's that guy was looking for him um and it, it made sense that leonard punched him because he hit him with the bottle he needed to because the guy was trying to kill him but he didn't know that before he hit him so yeah and then they just let he let dodd isn't dodd gonna come back and murder him anyway i, I think that there's a high probability he'll see dodd again i guess if you're wondering what happens dodd's still out there uh roaming the streets knowing that he has 200 grand maybe he'll be a little smarter next time but i mean there's also i mean there's a, a different layer so there's this like how do you do your actions mean anything if you don't remember them if you don't have any ultimate context to place anything or a grander context to evaluate your actions do they have any meaning? Do they have any ethical weight from an ethics standpoint, right? He's doing things. It's a moment. How do you evaluate the ethical actions of Guy Pierce's character in this? And how do you decide whether he's doing something that's morally correct or not? I mean, how do you make that determination? Yeah, it's your, it's your instinct, you know, as means like, as you know, for him, it's like, am I, if he clearly wasn't trying to do the bad, you know, do bad things. I mean, he ended, he ended up doing them, but like he's saying, he, he he remembers the world. Like he was saying, I remember all of these things about my life and who I am. I just don't remember anything since the accident. So you would know your own instincts. You would know your own actions, how, how they how they made sense. But, well, but only in a very um, short burst of time, in like five or ten minute intervals or whatever. I mean, you can't remember anything from moment to moment, so you can't know who's doing what or why. Or, or yeah, I mean, these determinations. like a voice. Why didn't he have a voice recorder? That's the other thing. I, uh, I suppose I, I that, that could that be too. tampered and, with. And there's all sorts of but things. Like, you, it wouldn't work. This is one of those movies that wouldn't work in 2021 or 2022 because everybody's got iPhones and you'd be able to do a lot more. Yeah, you could record yourself constantly. Like, you, why didn't he get like a camcorder, you know, and just like record himself? Like, hey, this is what happened when you're going to wake up. Remember this. And like, you know, yes, I get the notes thing. The notes can get tampered with and you can lose them. But like you could just record yourself. And then when you wake up, you're like, oh, what's going on? Hit play. OK, that's what's happening. You know what I mean? There would have been ways he could have fixed it. So some of the plot is a little implausible. But I mean, that's the thing with Nolan's movies. All, a lot of his movies, if you really start breaking it down, you could t- you can sort of take away things and like, ah, that doesn't make sense. That's kind of stupid. But if you just kind of let it wash over you. I don't, there's no one else like it, I don't think. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think people realize how much you love Christopher Nolan movies. And I, I, I love Christopher Nolan's movies, but my love pales in comparison to yours. Uh, I don't know anybody that likes Christopher Nolan as much as you. You are a fanboy to the max, uh, you know. Well, as a, it's so, go ahead. Be creative as hell. I don't think you can you can criticize him for a lack of creativity in, in his movies. The, the, maybe you can. I don't know. Maybe you're going to. But his movies are so creative. And the one thing that this movie only there's only a few times where there were like actual shots and directing. Like I thought when Leonard hit his head and the blood starts to pour and he's like looking face to face with his wife and the kind of camera pans out. I was like, oh, that's some director shit right there. Like that's that's some real like you can see because this was like a his first real movie. I mean, he had, I think, like an independent movie the following. I've seen it. It's OK. Um, he made that like on the weekends and basically paid for it himself. This is his first like movie movie where there's like a studio and somebody paying for it. But you can watch this movie like this dude is going to be like, I don't know, maybe one of the best filmmakers ever. When you watch it, you can kind of see the the DNA of his his movie making. Unfortunately, he just kind of used a lot of the same ideas where people pigeonhole him. But yes, I, I am a gigantic Christopher Nolan fan. Um, he hasn't made a movie that. I, I mean, I've been, I guess, maybe a little disappointed from some of them, but 
like you know, like Dunkirk. I couldn't have been more excited for that oh, movie. That's the energy note I wanted to share. I mean, I don't think people real uh, your ability to see other people's perspective on Christopher Nolan is limited. Because I remember you had a very nice time summer of I think of 2017, where you went to the theater, you saw Dunkirk. And it was uh, yeah, almost probably a religious experience for you. I don't know if it was that intense for you, but I saw you at work out of the next day, the day after, and you were just utterly confident that it was going to win Best Picture at the Academy Awards. You, it should have. It, it, it should have. There, it, and you wouldn't amend your claim even slightly. You wouldn't say, I love it. You're saying this is the best movie, even though it was way before Oscar season. You didn't even know what the competition was, and you weren't really reading the room. I couldn't shake it, and I couldn't get you to concede – the slightest concession that maybe it wouldn't possibly win, however much you loved it. Um, and I got you to bet a steak dinner <laughs> on Dunkirk winning a, the Oscar against the entire field. I had the field. Any movie that's not Dunkirk winning Best Picture, I win. Uh, you only win if Dunkirk wins. That, that was just how unshakable your love into Dunkirk was. And I saw Dunkirk, and I really, really enjoyed it. I had a great time at the movies, but I wasn't. I wasn't as blown away as you. I wasn't transcended and didn't think, oh, my God, this is the most mind-blowing cinematic experience ever. So that's where you're coming with this. But this is excellent. This, I mean, ask me next week and I change. This might be his best movie. It's it, There's so much to chew on. Um, I mean, I don't relate on the characters at all, but that's not super important to me. I, I engage with the movie itself. And, you know, my brother-in-law, he's a Ph.D. student. Um done a lot of film study stuff and I know he's written a lot of papers which will certainly include memento in them because there's so much really heady stuff going on I said well you can I mean like narratively there's there's a video of Chris Nolan himself like breaking down how he came up with the structure there are like PDFs of documents where you can kind of see how it all is planned out um, you know in a pretty brilliant way I mean, it was all intentional you know the, the well, way right. I, this movie lays out. Yeah, I don't think it was an accident. It, it, that's not you know, what I'm saying at all. You can see that in like, I'm going to write a study on, on, you know, narrative convention in film and talk about this and, and what meaning means and how we derive meanings as a film audience because we see it and the context constantly shifts and we're trying to rely on context clues, but then they keep changing the context and it keeps shifting because it's so episodic and what happens plays on these little vignettes uh, where the meaning shifts and we start to understand more and more but the character never understands and then but the, really the brilliance of it is the movie ends at the ending of the movie which you see what happens but the rest of the movie you're learning just like the way you would in any other movie where there's a reveal at the end where you're like oh that's what happened and that is the the secrets or the little pieces to that are given to you in the way a normal movie would be but it's done in, in reverse order so right. you know what I mean, like the the gymnastics that it takes to to kind of hide the the ball well, so throughout you, the entire movie, and then reveal it at the time when a normal movie would end, sort of third act. But it's actually the middle of the movie. I mean, the, this was serious. Just saying, it just takes amazing brilliance to pull that off. Wait, so did. let's talk about the ending because I guess maybe I, I saw it differently or I'm, I'm mixed up on something. Because doesn't it end with him driving away from Leonard after having killed the first guy? on his way to the bar to meet Natalie for the first time, Carrie Ann Moss's character. Isn't that the end of the movie? Yeah, and then he goes to the tattoo place, and then Teddy shows up, and then Teddy takes him um, to find Dodd, where he's got him in the apartment. So then it goes towards, and then, then, he, then Carrie Ann Moss tells him, you know, basically the, with the license plate that that's Teddy. Teddy's the one he's looking for. And then he ends up, you know, don't trust Teddy. Brings him to the place and shoots him, which is the end of the movie. Uh, so now, but the last I, I thing you see I, is him going to the tattoo parlor. But I think that happens. No, I, I mean, see, I think the I, I see the context chronology different. Maybe I'm wrong. This is where it gets confusing. He's going to get the tattoo. Teddy approaches him, but then he leaves with that car and and drives to the bar where he meets Natalie the first time, and she thinks he's the drug dealer boyfriend that he just killed. And she's like, oh, hey, hey, Jimmy or John or whatever the guy's name was. Oh, I thought you, I looked at your car. I thought it was somebody else. And then he goes into the bar, and that's the scene where she spits in the drink. She has the other guy, bar, the other patron spit in the drink. And that's where she meets him. And then they go to her house. Um, and they do all yeah, that stuff. Yes, that's chronolog chronologically what happens. But you don't see – you don't – you've seen that already at the end of the movie. Well, right. You see, but you see the very beginning. My point is I thought the last shot we see is the earliest point in the film. 
You're, nope. I, so well, then, then I guess I disagree because well, the earliest point in the film is is where he's on the phone. It, the black and white stuff is 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 the earliest. Oh, point in the film. sure. Okay, gotcha. So the black, that's where Teddy is talking to him on the phone. Right. So yeah. Gets him to come out and meet the guy. Okay. So the, the black and white and then the color stuff meet at the very end of the movie, but it's really the halfway point of the story. Got it. Okay. So that's that's the thing I'm missing is yeah before he comes out and, and like oh I've got the lead on this drug dealer guy who I think was dealing the drugs and I think this is this is your guy because then it, it fades it fades from black and white into color like he does that right at that that, that scene no where he's that makes sense out. I, yeah I got it. I was I was forgetting about the very long or winded conversation he has on the phone right um, in black and white like sprinkled throughout the movie but oh, that that makes sense. And then after that, then the rest of the Uber plot, that's he kills the guy, and then he meets Natalie, and then, then he faces Dodd, and he has Dodd in, and then he does all that stuff. Got it. Yep. Yeah, you got it. Okay. If you build you will come. All right. Well, uh, um, so let's move on. Uh, Letterbox Ebert rating. What did what'd you rate this movie? Uh, probably four and a half. I mean, uh, maybe even five if you let really, me really stew on it some more. But I think, I mean, I might, you know, between four and a half and a five. I'm trying to think. I, I don't know. There's just some reason in my brain I can't quite give it all the way to five. So I'll say four and a half. What about you? So I'm, I'm right in there. So uh, four, four and a half, five. Um, I, again, I, I don't think I would give it a five because I, I think some of his other movies are better. Um, you know, I, I think Inception's a five star. I think Dark Knight's five star. Ten, Tenant and this are like right neck and neck for me. Um, oh, wow. So yeah, probably four and a half. I probably get a four and a half, maybe four. Um, uh, for me, but yeah, I mean, all of his movies are gonna be right, right in that window for me. Um, again, I don't think it's a perfect movie. The dead wife stuff and the sort of the overly dramatic stuff and um, the the monologues, I think, take a little bit away from it. The other piece of it, like. Nolan later on is like one of the greatest action directors out there and the action, there's not a whole lot of action in this movie. I mean, there's some fighting and guns and stuff, but um, there's sort of the one chase scene, but well, I, he, later on in his career, he, he does that, does that better. I think. No, see, I, I like the action because it's so low key. I mean, this isn't really a quote unquote action movie, but the action have not felt very believable and, you know, plausible. it does have very stakes for for you know when you consider the rest of his movies which are about like saving the world and saving a city and all that stuff where this movie is just like a guy trying to trying to figure out what's going on with him oh it's all about identity and they just don't make movies like that anymore where it's like just about one person and their sort of internal personal struggle i I think they probably do eric i doubt you're just watching very many of them i think there's they, they probably are out there it's about one person's personal struggle that sounds like a lot of movies to me but okay well, I'm trying to find some. So yeah, we're we're all in the same format because yeah, I mean, I, it would be between this and Inception if you asked me to pick. In retrospect, I mean, I, there's a, I love Dark Knight. And it was a movie I liked at the time, but I don't know that I think it's quite so great. I think there's probably more actual flaws with the Dark Knight, but it was a, a separate podcast. Um, but it's right there. It'd be Memento and Inception. Those are those are neck and neck for the best best Nolan films in my brain. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's he's got a lot of great movies. Um, did, you, so Dunkirk, you're not putting it in there. You think Dunkirk's slower than than those? So two? I will say those are so one or two. Quentin Tarantino somewhere. was on a separate podcast, and he said Dunkirk's one of his like favorite movies, and definitely his favorite movie that year. So I got Quentin Tarantino. Dunkirk's on great. That, that's fine. Um, I, I, that's fine. It just clearly wasn't going to win Best Picture if you're trying to be objective about it. But that's fine. Uh, the other thing I was going to mention, just thought of it. I saw well, – actually, I was flipping through Wikipedia. Brad Pitt was supposed to be in this movie. He was supposed to play Leonard originally. See, that makes perfect sense because we got the nice 2000 frosted hair. Yeah. Got a very lean, fit, it's muscular, a, handsome lead. Getting yeah, the fittest, sketch, uh, sexiest conflict. insurance adjust, claims adjuster there is in Guy Pierce. That's uh, kind of a bummer because that this would be like a perfect Brad Pitt movie. But, you know, I, Guy Pierce is good. He, he had a moment too. I, L.A. Confidential is one of my favorites too. Like I love that movie. He's he's great in that. Some, he's some serious domestic abuse happened. in that movie too. Wow, there you go. Yeah, I don't know what what's the deal with that. Um, okay, sorry, that just uh, popped in my head. Um, if you build, you will come. 
All right, up next, the uh, Five Degrees of Field of Dreams. So we're going to connect this movie, Memento, to the Field of Dreams, greatest Iowa sports movie ever made. Sure. Uh, ben, would you like to go first sure. or would you like me to go So we're starting with Memento, and I'm picking Steven Tobolowsky, who plays Amy Jenkins in this movie. He's in a film called Groundhog Day with Bill Murray. Groundhog Day is incredible. Uh, Bill Murray is in another incredible movie called Ghostbusters with Dan Aykroyd. Dan Aykroyd is in another incredible movie called Sneakers, which we've already talked about. Uh, and then Timothy Busfield is in uh, Sneakers, as well as Field of Dreams. So I use Sneakers again, okay. but couldn't resist. That's all right. That works. Uh, all right. So I went uh, Carrie Ann Moss, who's in this uh, in Momenta, and she's just fabulous in this. I just want to reiterate that point. Um, she was in a movie called Red Planet. It came out around the same time as this. It's got like Val Kilmer in it. There's like a Mars movie. It's kind of stupid. Uh, but in that movie, he's also a guy named Tom. Or actually, so went with Val Kilmer. Val Kilmer's in a movie called True Romance, okay. which is a f- fabulous movie. Um, in that movie, he's a guy named Tom Sizemore. He's also in Red Planet, but I'm using him for True Romance. And Tom Sizemore is in a movie called Wider, which is the inferior Wider movie. It came out around the same time. Okay, Corral movie. It's a Tombstone. Tombstone's the superior movie. But uh, Kevin Costner's in that, and he's in Field of Dreams. Okay. So that, that's how I did that. Those are my five movies. Um, so, yeah, if you, if you listen to this, try, try your own, uh, own way to get from Memento to Field of Dreams. Okay. Last thing, Ben. What are we watching next? What are you picking? All right, so we've been kind of, we've been kind of on a little pretentious streak here. Uh, a lot of movies we really love and think are pretty great. I'm going to pick another movie that I love, but uh, we're going to do a little bit of dumpster diving here. We're going to we're going to dive into the muck of the '80s, and we're plucking out the Toxic Avenger. That's what I want to Ooh. watch. Okay, this was one of those. Uh, like rentals, blockbuster rentals that I don't think my mom was too keen on us getting. It's this is like a hard R, right? This oh, this movie? is it is. Yeah. I mean, this is an '80s R. This is really right, right, right. W- deliberately vile and graphic and grotesque and knowingly, winkingly, gross. It's uh, it's anyway. We'll we'll talk more okay. about it next week. But yeah, we're gonna I'm excited. I maybe have seen it before. I don't really remember anything other than that it's like super hard R. But yeah, I'm excited. All right, awesome. Well, yeah. So uh, listen, uh, you know, if you haven't listened to our other episodes, go back and listen to them. Um, if you haven't watched Toxic Avenger, go watch it. And and Ben, remember Sammy Jenkins. Oh, I will never forget. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye.